Blog Talk Radio. Warning, the following program may include profane language, controversial viewpoints, and perspectives on the true nature of reality so far removed from the status quo, they'll make your head spin like a top. Young children, corporate executives, and religious fundamentalists should turn away now. Good evening, planet Earth, and welcome to a very, very special edition of Extraordinary Year, the online show about 2012 for everyday people like you. My name is Tim Bravo, and I want to thank you for listening in tonight. T-183 days until December 21st, 2012. Remember, if you like the show, go like our Facebook page, facebook.com slash extraordinary year. You'll find links for everything we talk about on the shows. Plus, you can connect with like-minded people and stay on top of news and UFO sightings. Now... You guys out there listening know Extraordinary Year is designed to be a show aimed at everyday people, modern Westerners living regular lives, trying to keep the bills paid while soaking up as much info as as we can about how the paranormal actually intersects with and influences our lives and future. In the year 2012, we the people of Earth find walking among us certain individuals who are perfectly placed in our midst to help us understand the awesome depth and breadth of the reality we share and the momentous opportunity that we are presented with at this turning point in our history. Our guest tonight, Alara Blackwell, she's one such person. Alara's life experience to date is so well suited to this task of awakening the rank and file of our society, it stretches my imagination to think it could be anything but purposeful. As I'm sure you'll soon find, to hear Alara speak is to hear someone who is obviously authentic, open, honest. She's actually a very normal person like you and me in many ways. She's a graphic artist, a photographer. Her favorite mode of transportation is her motorcycle, and she's got a load of cool tats. But when it comes to direct experience with the supernatural world of human spirituality, when it comes to direct experience with extraterrestrials and their their favorite mode of transportation, when it comes to direct experience with clandestine military black ops and programs, there may be no other person like her alive. She's a natural-born remote viewer, a gift the military put to nefarious use while she was enlisted as a United States Marine. She's had tons of direct contact with all sorts of beings in the spiritual realm, not to mention multidimensional extraterrestrials, through whom she learned about her own off-world soul history in the Sirius system. So, Alara, thank you for taking the time to share your story with us tonight. Thank you very much. So it's good to, to talk about this, finally. Okay, so the first thing I would, I'd like to do real quick is get a brief overview from you of your early life. And what were the first indications you might have been born with some special spiritual talents? I thought everything that I did was normal. Apparently it wasn't. Uh, I could see spirits. I could see... Um, just things that not really anybody else could see. And I was lucky enough that my mom told me that, you know, it was okay um, because she was really spiritual too uh, while I was growing up. But some of the things that I try to think about my childhood, I really don't see anything different. Like I, when I try to think about it, there doesn't really seem to be much there. Uh, it's not that I haven't really lost time or lost memories. It's just, I don't, I don't really see anything, but talking with my family, um, they said that I, even from a really young age, I talked like an adult. um, And I kind of held myself like I was older than I I was. Like five years old, I'd sit there and talk about things that I probably shouldn't have known about. I would know how to do Native American rituals, um, and I would be able to talk to different um, spirits and things like that. My mom said that at night, she, even when I was a little baby, she would look over and she thought somebody would be standing over my crib. And so she'd flip on the light and then nobody would be there. So um, from the very beginning, I've had contact, I think. And it's been a, it's just been a part of my life. So well, Now, what sort of Native American rituals? Um, That's very I, interesting to me. My, my dad's side of the family, I'm a um, Blackfoot. And I would just know, like, little things. Like, I would sit around a campfire and start blessing people with smoke, or I would um, pick up feathers and start, like, trying to smudge people um, to, to clear their energy and things like that. And my mom's just like, where did you learn that? And I was like, I don't know. Doesn't everybody know this? And um, <laughs> some, of the, some of her friends were like, 
where did where did she live Whoa. this? And yeah, they're like, that's interesting. And I was like, yeah, it's just it's just part of something I did. I just kind of played and and I just understood how um, spirits worked and things like that. So it didn't seem out of the ordinary to me. And I was going out of body since I was very little. Like I think the first time that I actually went out of body, I was two years old. And um, then I did it again, like when I was seven, um, that I knew about. So it was it was really uh, really interesting. But I just it's just something I used to do. Those were accidental experiences, like you just found yourself out or saw your body. Um, the first time I did it, I was um, walking down my aunt's steps and I fell off of her steps and I cracked my head on uh, one of the, the gardening planters and I was in the hospital and I was actually floating in the top of the um, ceiling watching the doctor stitch my head up. And the time right after that, I think I had drowned in a in the hot tub at the community pool and my mom was freaking out and trying to resuscitate me and I was standing outside my body looking at her like going, you know, hey, you don't have to worry, I'm standing right here. And then I was like, wait, maybe I should be in my body. So I chose to like actually go back in my body and um, deal with that. <laughs> huh. So, wow, that's those pretty the two cool. very, very distinct times I remember doing that. Okay, well, and I'll, I want to get to spiritual stuff again a little later, um, but a couple of weeks ago, I did a, a poll of our audience to kind of prioritize show topics that we talk about, and the overwhelming winner was UFOs, disclosure, and extraterrestrial truth. I mean, that's what that's what extra uh, extraordinary year listeners seem to be hungriest for. So. Um, I want to get to your military experiences, um, but I'd like to first get into the extraterrestrial stuff right away, if that's okay. Oh, that's fine. That's I actually was dealing with the extraterrestrial stuff first before I was given my military memories back. So um, that's kind of how it was. It started was with them first coming to me, contacting me, um, learning the things I needed to learn, and then they kind of dropped the ball on me, saying like, "Oh, by the way, <laughs> you're part of these projects." Here's the memory huh. back. So that's how okay. that started. Now, there's there's a language that you used to write and speak growing up that mm -hmm. you now know is actually an extraterrestrial tongue. Is that right? Correct. Is it Syrian? Um, I don't know if it's Syrian specifically. Um, the ETs I talk to say it's kind of like a common tongue where um, since they talk telepathically a lot, uh, they, they kind of don't really use it all that often. But... When I started speaking it, I was almost channeling it from them because they told me that it would bypass my consciousness and go straight into my subconscious. So I wouldn't misinterpret the message that was coming. And then at that point, it would kind of come up from my subconscious as a knowing or as information um, that would gradually like come into my awareness. So they kind of did it as a as a bypass to me accidentally messing up a message or information that I was supposed to be getting. Because I knew, I understood what they were telling me, but I couldn't actually directly translate it for almost about a year, year and a half, in working with the language. But you just kind of knew it and, and would kind of work with it as a kid as kind of a... a something you you thought you might have made up but you know, it was pretty intricate I, I, i'm just yeah. going off of um the ufo congress interview yeah that you yeah did. um i in high school i had notebooks full of this glyph language um i just thought it was automatic writing uh, and i just just left it as it was and didn't really think anything of it until i started doing it again it about three years ago so is i was there, like wait a second is there any chance i might be able to convince you to maybe send us a scan of a, you know, just a maybe a passage in that, oh, just sure. to yeah. post for listeners on our Facebook page. That's that would be that would be kick ass. Um, yeah, I've been thinking about scanning in like my notebooks of all the different ETs that I've seen that I've sketched, um, the star language, the um, I have like what looks like equations for different things. I know one is like an equation for teleportation and things like that, or like how to move mass from one point in space to another point in space. Um, Though it doesn't really translate over to our mathematics, because I was like, this, there's no symbols here that we use. So huh. uh, it's uh, it's really interesting. I'm like, it's some sort of math thing. I don't know. <laughs> just, I just write it down. Okay, so you found out that um, your sort of soul history is from Sirius. It's a star system, right? Right. Now, do you have common contact with? specific Syrians, or are you sort of plugged into, um, you know, the the group of Syrians who might be around the planet at this time? 
Well, I have a couple of ETs that I work with, or interdimensionals, really, that are around me that I can kind of, if I stop for a second and quiet my mind, I can contact them and ask information. Um, Sometimes they'll give it to me, sometimes they won't. And sometimes I'll just sit there and chat with them about being here. Um, And I know a lot of my, my writing is kind of me chronicling my experience here, and it's a whole awakening process. And somehow writing it down transfers that. I'm not really sure how, but it does. Um, and the Syrians, I just knew like I was from there. I just knew I was from there. And I got confirmation from that um, from somebody who channels a being from Sirius called Adronis. Um, it's Brad Johnson. And I was talking to him because I was like, oh, cool, he channels a being from Sirius. Like, I kind of want to find out, you know, if what I'm talking about is true. So um, during the channeling session, he said, you know, are you, do you know where you're from? And I said, yeah, I'm from Sirius. And he goes, yes, you definitely are. And he goes, at any point, you can contact any one of us, and we will come and help you, you know, just so you know that. And I was like, oh, wow, like, okay, that's cool. Um, so, yeah, I just, I've just been working with Syrians, but I've worked with a bunch of different races um, over the last couple of years. Well, that's interesting that you mentioned the uh, you know channeled entity from Sirius because my next question, <laughs> actually, uh, then the whole reason I brought this up was one of the most prominent and consistent channeled entities in the 2012 blogosphere. For those who kind of follow that sort of thing, is an individual named Salusa or Salusa who uh-huh. claims to be from Sirius as well. So I was wondering if you are personally aware of Salusa. I haven't had contact with Salusa. Um, I I listened to the channelings um, and every once in a while, and I was like, oh, that's that's pretty cool. Um, but I've never had a contact where they're like, this is who I am. But there's a lot of beings <laughs> from Sirius system. Sirius is not a small system by any means. Um, there are quite a number of planets that were inhabited. Um, and then I also had contact uh, with my family, star family, when I went through the Stargate at Emeru Maru in, in Peru. And... Um, that was an experience. Um, you, I had about when, two or three. You went weeks. through a stargate. Yeah, there is. A, I don't know about you, that. Yeah, if you look up um, Peru, there's a stargate down there. Uh, it's a it's a doorway cut in the side of a rock. This red rock. It's a lot like Sedona, um, and, and, and it's like consistency. Like I picked it up and I was like, wow, this is the same type of rock. And um, I guess there's a way you can go through physically, uh, but I kind of cheated that a little bit and I went bilocated through it. I stepped out of my body and walked in and there was a stargate there and um, I accessed it and was kind of um, couldn't really pull back a lot of memories because when I was gone I knew I was gone but um, the brain really can't comprehend half the things I was seeing. So um, I finally kind of came back to where I was and then stepped through it again and ended up going to the serious system and I know I spent quite quite some time there um, out of body like I was out of body for probably about a half an hour and um, but on the other side it was a few weeks and um, I was not happy when I got back <laughs> I was like I don't want to be here like I was yeah I was ranting for a while because I was just so homesick at that point um, and I finally just calmed down and we had to figure out how to get back to the city um, in the middle of Peru so we were occupied with that but it was definitely a really great experience um, did you go to peru specifically for that experience or just happened yeah, to be there yeah i went there for that and to go to Machu Picchu. um and that was uh the two spots that we we went to peru to go to go see because we want to see if we get access to stargate and um i didn't go through physically which i guess some people figure out how to do but i definitely uh, went through and just bilocated and went in so that's pretty awesome that sounds pretty awesome so how often do you have contact with ETs? I mean, I know you said that you can just kind of quiet your mind. Is it something you do pretty much on a daily basis then? Yeah, it's a, it's a daily basis kind of thing. Um, I mean, I'll check in to see because it's kind of they have a higher perspective than me. Like I check into my higher self and my um, my divine self, and then I kind of check in with the ETs for their kind of take on something, either be in um, someplace like I want to go, like the Super Soldier Summit, or coming out with information like this. I know last year I asked 
if it was okay if I started talking about my military experience and um, I was told no, it wasn't going to be safe for me, that I needed to do it through a group. So then a year later at the UFO Congress, that's when Miles approached me and uh, asked me if I wanted to do a video for him. And I figured it was going to be like some clips, like maybe 15 minutes, and he was just going to put me in a video with some other people. But then, lo and behold, it was the entire interview. And I was like, oh, (laughs) (laughs) didn't expect that. I was like, okay, well, now cat's out of the bag. Like, there you go. Well, and he may have gone into the experience thinking the same thing, but I, you know, what he captured in your story are so, um, uh, well, I, I don't, I, I don't want to say important. I mean, it, it is. That's not the word I'm looking for, though. It's just so groundbreaking, really. And so, uh, for for people out there who are hungry for this sort of information, uh, to have this sort of truth, the, the just the multitude of tidbits of information that you dropped on the world in that interview. Um, just speaking as someone who is personally hungry for that sort of truth, I, it was just a phenomenal thing to, to have and to hear. And so I'm glad that it came forth and I'm glad that you've come forth and I definitely, um, applaud you for doing so. Thank you. So, um, one, it's an idea I've had and I don't know how realistic this is, but I would love to arrange some sort of a back and forth conversation in real time with you and your contacts. Would something like that even be possible? And I don't mean now. I just mean sometime in the future down the road. Um, yeah, that would, I guess that would be possible. I mean, I can have them talk usually through me. It's almost like a, I act as like the telephone. Like they'll sit there and chat at me. Um, I've done it a few times, at least with personal friends, where I've sat there and we just talked about the nature of existence. Um, and at least from like the guys that I work with, and their take on it, um, and my working with the Galactic Federation and Ash Shark Command, and um, and it's it's interesting. Like I, I do it every once in a while, but it's become so just personal for me just to kind of sit there and chat with them. Um, I never really think about doing it, I guess, for other people. But yeah, definitely, I'd sit down and and kind of act as a as a go between. Well, I think it could be groundbreaking and and a, an incredible opportunity to to let you know a few listeners call in and ask direct questions short direct questions and uh and just kind of see what sort of back and forth we can get and see if maybe uh some information that is helpful to you know the the public at large might come forth yeah that'd be really cool i've done it personally for people in readings um, where i've talked to um some of their guides and um checked in to see if they've had any type of um, manipulation energetically because I find a lot of people who are intuitively aware um, tend to get messed with a lot on an energetic level from either the government or the shadow government Hmm. or the cabal or whatever someone wants to call it. Um, So it's really interesting to see that and and I'm kind of learning how to pick up on that stuff and I sometimes even surprise myself about how accurate I get. Like, people are like, wow, like, that's totally on point. I'm like, oh, that's good. Like, okay, good, I'm good and do this right. Like, I'm always open with people and telling them, you know, if I'm not getting anything, please tell me. Like, let me try to adjust um, because it's just so new for me to actually sit there and, and try to help other people um, find their contact with their star family or their med teams um, and get them working where they need to be. So it's uh it's it's brand new for me, which is it's fun and it's a learning experience. Then you kind of segue into um what I want to talk about next. I want to go ahead and get into the the secret government, the the military black ops and black programs uh apparatus that you eventually were given back the memories um that you were actually used as kind of a tool for them. Um, Can you give listeners a quick synopsis of how you came to realize you were being used as a remote viewer? Um, I, like, I've always had problems, I guess, Um, like mental health issues and things like that, but there was no reason for it. Like, I had no memory of anything that should have caused me to either have depression or, um, like, disassociation or multiple personalities, things like that. But I was having these um, these episodes, and I couldn't figure out why. And um, I just kind of just chalked it up to being like, you know, okay, it just it happened. So there's nothing I can do about it. Well, when I was in um, Ohio, I went to a conference with a group of friends. And while we were standing around, we were approached by a woman who... Um, thought that we were infiltrating. So it was a spiritual convention. It was like a big spiritual gathering. And she thought we were military or black ops. 
And um, a lot of us were like, no, we, we're just here, you know, to, to, you know, we wanted to give a plaque to this um, Chief Gold Light Eagle who was doing all this work for the spiritual community. And um, she goes, no, two of you here are military. I know it. I can see it. Like, I was a part of this. I know you're here. Well, at that point, we looked around, and there's about 15 of us, and only two of us had been prior military. It was me and a friend of mine. And um, she started talking and talking about being a part of these black ops programs, being um, trained as a split personality assassin. Um, and it, it was, I wish I could remember her name or her story, but I don't, because at that point while she was talking, my brain completely phased out. Like I couldn't even understand what she was talking about, but I knew it was something that wasn't related to what I was doing. And um, at the end of it, she, she could have told me anything, and I probably would have done it. I mean, she could have said, take down the person next to you, and I would have completely listened uh, without hesitation. And instead, though, she said, you're free. And as soon as she said that, um, all these memories started flooding back. And um, me and, and, and my friend, too, he, we both just started crying. Like, it was like all of a sudden somebody just opened a floodgate and said, by the way, this is what's been happening to you. And um, that whole night I was, like, freaking out. I was sitting there going, oh, my God, that's real. This is what I've been doing. I was talking to my friends about it. And they're just looking at me like, holy crap. And um, I was like, my life makes sense. I'm like, oh my. It's like all the pieces that I was missing started falling into place about why I did certain things, what was going on in my life, um, why I moved to certain places. And it was um, it was a shock. And I spent a couple of days kind of processing it and trying to figure out if I should look up anything. And even my friends were like, oh, yeah, go look up, you know, Duncan O'Finian. Go look up Aaron McCollum. And I was like, okay. And then I wouldn't even look. It was like something just kept me from even researching anything that I was a part of. Um, and I knew it was a part. It was a hypnotic command. It was a don't talk about it. Don't don't even mention it. Don't look it up. Don't try to research it. And I kind of just accepted that. I was like, okay, well maybe I just have these memories and I'll just leave it be. So um, at the Yoko Congress in 2011, I approached a couple people asking about it, and everyone's kind of like, no, we don't really know what you're talking about, or oh, we kind of know what you're talking about, but it's, that's a little bit, out, I don't know, like, a little out there. So I spent an entire year with these memories going, like, I don't know, I'm like, maybe, like, I'll just focus on school and um, maybe I'll, something will be brought up after that. So it's uh, not until this video with Miles that I, it actually really, that this stuff actually happened to me. Um, so I've been dealing with that since February, going, like, no, this is actually real. Like, oh, <laughs> like, whoops. Make, oh, this is real, like for real, and it still kind of shocks me. I'm still at the point going, like, really, this happened? Like, they do this to people, and um, the more I, I uncover, the more I just wonder if I want to find out anymore. Do you continue to uncover new memories from that period? Yeah, and it's and they're vague, which makes it even more frustrating. Like, I don't have anything solid, but at the same time. That might be a safety mechanism. Um, I know definitely if I started remembering names or places or faces, um, I would be completely quieted in one way or another. So um, all I get right now are vague memories and meeting people who can confirm certain things about what I've done. Um, and even even randomly was um, had a confirmation about infantry in the Marine Corps about being injected with um, vaccines more than normal um, and about them kind of intuitively knowing where bad guys were or where to go and that's what I did. I, I remote viewed battlefields and then could tell certain people like don't go that way, there's bad guys that way, go left. You know, don't go away. that place is like rigged, like don't go in there and um, I've met infantry that have said that they were like super lucky and they couldn't figure out why, they just knew not to go to certain areas. So that kind of confirmed about like what my job was, was to send that kind of information to them. Um, so that was the, um, that was the trip. I was like, oh, that's, that actually happens. So. so you found yourself in the combat scenario, but in a, an out-of-body state, and right. you I was were always, assisting. always out of body. Mm -hmm. I actually mm -hmm. never went into combat physically that I could remember, unless they moved me to different places. Um, like even people talk about the 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 whatever special ops, black ops, and planes and stuff that can super fast. You know, people getting picked up and and no abs and stuff. And part of me still goes like, does that really happen? I don't even know. So I don't have any solid memory of stuff like that. 
Um, I do know, though, that I've been out of body and that I've been approached out of body by military personnel, uh, not ETs. They're in military uniform, walking through my walls, coming up to me and, um, and asking me to go with them. So something was going down. Um, I just didn't really know what it was. Now, you're going to be doing a super soldier summit this Saturday, and... Um, now, I, and you weren't yourself a super soldier, but the military did pair you with super soldiers in combat scenarios, right? Correct. And these How super that soldiers work? that I worked with um, were very intuitive, telepathic, telekinetic, pyrokinetic. Um, they had a lot of abilities. Now, I don't know if they were trained that way, if they were made. I have no idea. I just remembered that certain people I could connect with and they could hear me. So I would be out of body, and this is, this is some of the memories that I've had that I thought were maybe dreams, but um, now I know that we're not, because they weren't even structured as dreams. It was very, very real, very lifelike, um, and I would be with somebody, like, floating next to them or looking through their eyes while they were on a mission, and when they got to a certain point, they'd stop, and I'd step out of their body and walk around and go find out where either, like, a, usually patrol or security was. And then I'd step back in their body, and then they'd continue on um, and, and proceed to go, like, into the building or into a firefight. And then we would, would get our objective, and I would follow them out. Um, and, and I would step out of their body and watch them leave. And as soon as that happened, I would um, say a command phrase. And I'm pretty sure this is when they would actually physically pick me up, because I think this is the point where I was drugged um, and reporting directly to somebody that had me under hypnosis so I could give them literally a play-by-play of exactly what was happening with that small um, unit, whatever their mission was. So your body is in some building somewhere in America, and your 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 actual spirit is off. Body. Yeah. Your astral yeah. body is off in combat somewhere else, and yeah. then at the proper time, um, they you bring yourself back with with this command word, or did they do that? I would probably just give, I think, because I would speak constantly, almost like running commentary. So I would say probably some uh, command phrase saying, you know, the, the objective's been completed. They're out of, you know, they're out of that radius of whatever that area was. Then okay. I would be given a, a code word, come back to my body. Um, they would inject me with something again and, and bury the memories and then let me go, put me back to wherever I was. And, um, and then I'd be none the wiser. I just, you know, think I didn't sleep that well that night. Huh. Now... Yeah. I also know there was an instance since you've left where, you know, you being aware of people around you, um, you, you, you became aware of being remote viewed yourself from a military standpoint as if they were keeping tabs on you. Um, and you kind of turned the tables on them in an instance that you talked about in the UFO Congress video. Can you, can you quickly tell us about that, how, how you turned the tables on them? Um, I I was frustrated, and um, I was trying to study for finals, I think, and um, I finally just decided to, to do something about it, because I knew they were watching me, and I'm always willing to kind of um, believe things that most people would stop themselves, like being out of body, you'd have to kind of have some sort of um, ability to kind of just accept the fact that you're out of body. And that's one of the hardest things to do. So I kind of always play around when I'm out there because I figure that's the fastest way to figure out what I can and cannot do. Um, so I saw I saw them and I was like, okay, there they are, and I grabbed them. And um, I saw that silver cord that usually people talk about, about out of body having a silver cord. So I just followed that back into um, an underground base, and it surprised me. And that's how I knew I was not making this up because I was like surprising myself. I was like, whoa, like I didn't expect to see this. Uh, I was thinking it was going to be some room, like a hotel room or something, but I actually fell into a, an underground base where they had a guy that was hooked up to electrodes, um, had some sort of like IV drip in him, and he was floating in a tank, and he was talking. And um, and that kind of weirded me out because I kind of remembered something like that where you're sitting there reporting to somebody. And there's a gentleman in a suit that was sitting next to this um, tank that was in the floor, like a float tank, and um, he was writing everything down or typing it on this like little laptop. And I finally just kind of sat on him and just told him to repeat after me, and I started telling them who I was. 
and they kind of freaked out. And um, like a lot, I saw alarms going off. They're dragging this guy out of the out of the tank, injecting him with I think adrenaline because he like woke up really suddenly and he was back in his body. Um, and the guy that was had the suit like picked up everything and just started talking to somebody on the phone. It was like you know we've been compromised. Um, and then I kind of didn't hear anything else after that because I was so like I was so surprised that I just jumped back right into my body and was like. Oh, whoops! <laughs> like, hmm. Well, then, I was like, well, they know that I can do that. I was like, well, I'll see what happens. But they've left me alone, so I'm not really sure. You know, some days I'm like, you know, did I actually do anything? I don't know, but it definitely seemed like I did. And Seems like they got the hint anyway, or at least yeah, they figured they out a way like, to. Oh, but, they, but they still watch me. I mean, I still every once in a while will catch a remote viewer watching me, and um, and I'll just be like, whatever. You know, why don't you guys just call me on the cell phone? Like, it's, <laughs> you have my number. You know exactly where I live. Um, but they haven't done it yet, so. I don't know. We'll see. They've left me alone for the last couple years. Okay. Now, in your experience, did the military have ties with extraterrestrials? I don't know, because my my military experience actually stopped my remote viewing for a little while. Um and I think they want to see, because I was remote viewing for the military, or for the government, I guess, secret government, black ops stuff, when I was a kid and when I was a teenager in high school. Um, so when I joined the military, um, I I have missing time while I was in, like weekends that I don't remember. And I was on the exact same base that I grew up next to. So I'm pretty sure something probably happened during that time. Um, but I don't have anything directly related between the military and the ETs. And even when I think about the stuff I was doing before, I know that I had to kind of remote view certain places, but nothing really, like, connects military plus ET to me when I when I think back to it. Um, to me, that seems like two separate things. Um, but I also remember that every time I got picked up by um, the government people, immediately after they brought me back, I'd be picked up by ETs. So they were always always picking me up right after the government did something. So I don't know what that's about. I don't know if they were helping me or if they were getting information. Um, who knows? So I just know that that's it's always been kind of a, a double thing for me. It's always happened it's in correlation with both of them. Just kind of a debrief. Yeah. Okay, now when the, the ones that would pick you up, I, I know you've said in the past you've had contact and, and have seen several different sorts of of off-worlders but the ones that would pick you up would they be you know all like a galactic federation smorgasbord or was it a particular group uh, i seem to work with a particular group of ets though i've seen various races the ones i work with um, i don't know if they're considered syrian i actually haven't really even asked um, i just know what they look like they're generally tall with pale skin big eyes um they have three fingers, maybe four sometimes, um, and highly telepathic. And um, What about hair? They, no hair. Usually they would look human, um, but then they told me that that was just something to make me feel better. Like they would project a human persona. Um, oh. But when they took the human persona off, yeah, it was no hairs, completely bald, tall, really thin necks, thin arms, long arms, long legs, torsos. They usually were wrapped either like in a, something that kind of looks like maybe like a toga or robe, or they would be wearing jumpsuits. And, um, yeah, they'd just show up and be like, hey, like, what's up? So that so basically you got comfortable enough with them to allow them to, you know, you say basically say, go ahead, guys, be who you are. You're not going to freak me out. Well, yeah, and it was because it was during actually a meditation, and I was doing this meditation out of my body. I was like standing out of my body, and I thought they were just like my spirit guides. And they are just like, you know, we're not your spirit guides. I was like, what? <laughs> so I'm like, yeah, we're not your spirit guides. I was like, well, who are you? They're like, well, you're, you're your medical team. I was like, you mean like ETs? And they're like, yeah, like ETs. I'm like, so do you really look like this? And they're like, no. I was like, okay, well, what do you really look like? And they're like, are you sure? Do you want to see? And I'm like, yeah, no, I'm ready. And so they they shifted back into their normal form. And I was like, oh, that's cool. I was like, oh, cool. like I never knew. And I was like, okay, well, I guess this changes everything. <laughs> I was like, this puts a whole new spin on this whole spirit guide thing. I was like, okay, so do you, like, what do you guys do? And I, I just sat there and they kind of told me how things work about multidimensional existence and how um, all these things kind of exist together. 
that they're just one one level of existence, um, and it's that my awareness would start to um, become like awakened in the next couple of years, and that was my job because they pretty much told me to stop like being lazy and actually do spiritual work. Because at that point, I was just so, so focused on school that I didn't really do anything else. I wasn't meditating. I wasn't really doing anything and then they're like no you need to start doing this again and start waking up and paying attention like you have abilities you need to start using them and I was like okay well I'll start and um, (laughs) and then it just kind of accelerated from there so the extraterrestrials are telling the girl who you know can meditate see them and you know have out of body experiences that she needs to stop being lazy and start doing spiritual work and (laughs) and, and awaken I need to start working. Like, I was like, oh, they're like, your r is over. Like, you had time to just chill and be human for a little while, but you're not human. And I actually cried in relief when they told me I wasn't human. I was like, oh, thank God. <laughs> I <was> like, <laughs> oh, I knew it. I was like, I'm not from here. And they're like, yeah, you're totally not. And I was like, oh. I, like, I don't know. For some reason, I was really upset because I knew I wasn't from here, but I just didn't know what or why. And, um, and that, that was kind of very comforting to know that I'm not from originally from this planet. I don't know why. The good news is you can skip out on the racial karma. Yeah, exactly. And that's the other thing that I was told, and I couldn't figure out why, neither could the psychics that I had readings from. They're like, you know, you have no karma here. And I was like, really? They're like, yeah. We're like, like, you must be here to do something else because there's no karma that you're paying back. And I was like, oh, sweet. Well, and I was like, uh-oh, wait, that means responsibility. <laughs> I was like, oh, great. Here we go. And... uh so- well, let me yeah. let me ask you this question about your your regular contacts. Um, I assume they're just the same guys as you were just discussing. Mm-hmm. For the most they've part, they've changed. I mean, they've changed a couple. I call them my counsel, and they're okay with that because they are. It's like a, it's like five of them that I can sit there and talk with, um, unless I'm up on ship, and then I'm usually talking to somebody else, and I can sit there and, and talk to different like uh, I've talked to different commanders and things like that um, up on ship. And that's usually in dream. Like, it comes off as dreams to me, like dream time. Uh-huh. But that's not the only way that I can't remember without kind of freaking out and being like, no, I was a bunch of shit. Like, oh, that's, that's kind of scary. Uh, but I remember so, them taking me and stuff. So, yeah. What? Okay, so we're we're told we're third density and um, hypothetically moving to a fourth density or something like that. The, you say these guys are a level of existence. Would would you characterize them as the next level up or a level beyond that? Um, from what I can understand, and I guess this really depends on what your definition of dimensional densities are, because there's a few different versions. Um, I would say they're kind of like in the 5-6 range. Like they're, We're supposed to be moving to like the fifth world, right. um, being 5D. So they're kind of like 5D, 6D, because they move interdimensionally through a lot of different like space like they just I don't know I try to wrap my brain around it and sometimes I just can't I'm like okay <laughs> like I just have to accept that they move through dimensions and that time doesn't exist where they're at and um, and they have to actually move into this dimension to contact me um, I'm pretty complicated like and I, I feel like that's a cop out but I really just I don't understand the mathematics of it I don't understand the science of it that's just not my it's not my forte I'm not um, I'm not a scientist so. Well, and you talked about being aboard ship, and mm-hmm. for whatever reason, I completely glossed over in setting up questions for you tonight to even think about asking you uh, about the interior of these ships. You know, can you can you give us kind of a you know, say a regular person, just normal Earthling who doesn't deal with this sort of thing, um, finds themselves aboard ship? What do they see? Um, the the memories that I have that are the clearest are with a group of people, um, probably about 20 to 30, maybe more, um, in a giant, I guess it looks like a cafeteria. Um, it's very, very akin to kind of Star Trek, I guess, where everything's very minimal. Um, they have giant windows that would look over, like, into space, and all the tables were kind of this gray metal material, um, and they're just, like, set up as sometimes, like, bench tables or sometimes it's, like, small round tables, chairs around it. And um, and I just remember sitting there talking to people, drinking something, and um, and just waiting to see what would happen. But, it's yeah, it's kind of, it's like, I don't know, I guess Star Trek kind of has it right. It's not, it's not exactly like that. But, once again, my brain has to give me something to comprehend what I'm on or what I'm mm-hmm. doing. So... Mm-hmm. 
it's probably like the easiest thing I can reference um, from my own experience. That's something I can see. But I do also know that there are um, various biodomes and biospheres that exist inside the ship that I've seen um, entire ecosystems for different types of beings that can't live in certain atmospheres. And I know I've, I've walked by certain places where you can actually look in and see like an entire ecosystem based for whatever beings that are working on ship and they work from that 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 biosphere um, and interact with the ship as well. So Was I there any that. obviously alien fauna and flora in that biosphere that you saw? Um yeah, I, it's at least the stuff that I remember was I mean it was plant life but um, nothing that I've seen on Earth. Um I don't know how to explain it. It was just different stuff, phosphorescent or um, just not something that I would normally think of as as being plant. Like I don't know. It's, like I said, it's hard to kind of reference that kind of stuff because it becomes very difficult to maintain those memories. And I don't know why that is um, because they, they're stored like dreams, where it's I think about it and um, I can remember it, but it's nothing solid. I mean, I could probably sit there and draw what it looks like. Uh, that, um, they're interesting. I mean, there's been stuff where they didn't have any plants. I know I saw some things that were water-based. Um, and it's in and, and atmospheres that I knew I couldn't walk into. They're like, you can't survive in there, so you can't go in there. And I was like, okay. So these these ships have, their crew are a kind of a, a, a multiple multiple species, multiple races in one ship. Yeah. And it's, because um, they're all like part of one organization. Right, and and some are like more energetic than others, um, but the ones I interact with seem pretty solid to me. And most of the time when I was on ship, I was interacting with um, medical teams, so either like doctors or psychic doctors, um, or they were putting me through some sort of training scenario. Um, I've actually walked out of what would be considered a holodeck a couple of times where I was like, you know, I don't even want to play right now, and I just, like, open up a door and walk out into the ship, and they're like, well, <laughs> like, you're not supposed to do that. I was like, well, I don't want to do this right now. Like, I have to go. I don't want to be in a ship. Like, I have things to do. I need a good night's sleep. Like, let's do this. Like, let me out of here. Like, I played this game. I figured it out, and I'm done. Willful starseed. <laughs> yeah, they're just like, <laughs> what? You're Like, you shouldn't even figure out how to do this. And I was like, who are you talking to? I was like, I read sci-fi so I can figure you guys out and then totally one-up you. Nice. <laughs> cool. Okay, so <laughs> out of the ships, back to the astral levels of Earth and the military black ops stuff. Okay. I've heard you talk about a sort of astral technology that the black ops military have called scuttlers. Yeah, it's, that was more of Miles' term. Like, I... I don't, I guess that's something that he saw, but to me they look like um, just mechanical constructs. And I guess they could look like spiders, but I've mostly just seen stuff like embedded in people's energetic fields. And they, they are not supposed to be there. Um, some of them look like um, black spikes, or like maybe like the size of a chopstick, um, that sit in there and disrupt energetic fields. Or I'll see things that are generally locked over shocker points. Um, huh. mostly over the heart chakra or over the stomach. And um, and if they're there, and if they've been there long enough, uh, when I start pulling them off people, uh, people have a very visceral emotional reaction um, when that happens. So I'm like, oh, I'm like, are you okay? And they're like, no, like I feel so much better. I I just need to sit here and like cry and release and just like deal with whatever this is. Um, and I'm like, that's intense because, like I said, I've been I'm learning. I've had to kind of learn or relearn how to recognize what this stuff is. So you have seen sort of this astral technology, other than the like the little and and for the listeners out there who haven't seen the the Miles interviews, can you kind of quickly explain what the uh, what he called the scuttlers? What what they well, what he, their purpose he is? described is was a astral construct that can attach itself to technology or people, and they look kind of like spiders, and they run around. Um, and I've had other people talk about these like spider construct machines uh, that they've seen like coming out of the earth and things like that. 
Um, and that's what he was he was describing. Um, for me, though, I just it's more like just pieces of machinery or something that's just more um, non-organic, especially What's in shape purpose? and in feel. I just think it's to lock down people to to keep them from awakening if they're sensitive or have abilities to have them um, not have access to those abilities, and then um, and then to 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 do something. I mean, most of the people that I've talked to have been prior military that I pulled stuff off of. So I know it has to do something with um, some sort of military projects and things like that. Um, and I've also seen um, things that look like cords attached to people as well, but I haven't been able to follow those back anywhere. I just tend to pull them off of people and, and unhook them. Attached to what part? Um, usually the back of the head or the top of the head um, or the spine. Huh. And... Um, yeah, it's a little. I was like, I don't know what this is, but it's got to go. <laughs> like, let's just unhook that, and then uh, we'll just leave it as is. Like, let's just let it go. Is it similar to the silver cord, or is it a different color texture? It it kind of reminds me of like the the Matrix thing, where like it's that like in the back of the head, like oh right thing. Like that's that's kind of the feeling it gives me. Um, which kind of creeps me out a little bit, and um, I just like you know whatever it is, it could just be the the image that I get for something that's a mind control type program, and that's just how my brain visualizes it. Because I'm very visual, so I when I see things visually, then I can affect it rather than just looking at the strings of code that I can see in people's energetic field. Um, I tend to form it into images, so I can pull those things off of people, or decode them and, and break the code and and pull them off. You just know they didn't come with that, so yeah, that's not something you're born with. <laughs> that's after that's aftermarket part right there. Yeah, definitely. So you do readings for people. Um, you, you're doing spiritual work on a regular basis. Mm -hmm. Can you describe your process? In other words, are you using remote viewing for that, or are there other methods yes, that you yeah, employ? Yeah, definitely. Um, I've been I've been using Skype a lot, um, just because it's it's easy and it's easy access, and that way I can see the person. Um, then what I generally do is I will go into a trance like state and then jump out of my body, and I'll I'll bilocate and stand where that person is, and then start to kind of energetically, with their permission, um, integrate with their field, just so I can see what's there. And then usually when that happens, then I start to see their guides. Um, or ETs standing around them. At that point, I then just relay information from those beings to them. And then anything that I kind of pick up that I feel that they might need to know about, I'll ask about it. I'm like, hey, is there anything like this that, you, that you're working on or that you need to know about? Um, and I make sure that the information is relevant to the person I'm reading. And Are you not, speaking I mean, with the person the whole time? Or uh -huh. is kind of you go and then come back and report? No, I can speak with somebody at the same time. I can do two things at once. I can sit there and clear someone while I'm talking to them. And um, and then once I start to kind of trip over things or hear things from their guides, then I start to to ask them what's what's going on. Speaking of what's going on, <laughs> I I get the assumption on my part, but I assume that you've come forward as part of a soul agreement to help people awaken because mm -hmm. something big is happening on this planet right now. Yes, definitely. What do your ET contacts have to say about what's going on here right now? Um, there is a push for freedom, freedom of consciousness. Um, they they will not tell me what's going to happen at the end of 2012. I keep oh. asking, and they oh. keep saying, <laughs> like it's like ruining the end of a good book. We're not letting, we're not telling you what's going to happen. And I was like. Oh. I was like, lightsabers? And they're like, no. I was like, come on. <laughs> I can't have lightsabers. Like, teleportation? They're like, mm. I was like, is that a yes or a no? They're like, we're not saying anything. I was like, uh-oh. I was like, that's all I want. Teleportation, let's go. Um, so I mess with them all the time. I mean, and they'll, they'll just, they just tell me to wait. They're like, just wait. You'll see. I'm like, okay, well, if we fine. have real freedom, I mean, we, we know that we have as just, we humans have teleportation technology. In fact, yeah. I'll be talking next week with some people who've done it. Um, so if we're, if, you're, if we're talking about real freedom, if that's what we achieve, then you know teleportation and everything else that's been suppressed by these bastards will yes. not not to judge, but I'm a judging. I'm judging these guys. <laughs> um, but you know, I, I think the teleportation and new energy, etc would be yeah. uh, come par for the course or whatever. 
All so, I know is I, I don't feel doomsday. I don't feel any of that. I know people are going to be fine. It's just there's going to be a lot of adjustments that's going to have to happen. They haven't um, given you any sort of ballpark, you know, loosely worded uh, prognostications about what we can expect for the rest of this year or how it's going to play out? Nothing. Um, I usually can pre-cog really well. I can see, like, at least for my own timeline into the future um, a little ways. And this whole year, I have not been able to see past, like, a month or an event. Like, I couldn't see past the UFO Congress. And then everything that happened after that, I was, I was like, whoa, a complete surprise. Um, and even to this point, like, going to the Super Soldier Summit, complete surprise. Um, so I'm not getting anything. They're just like, no, just keep doing what you're doing and, um, you know, just roll with it and have fun. And I was like, okay, why, well. Why do you think that is, why do you think that it's different this year? Is it becoming increasingly more difficult? It is. And I think it's just because there's so much possibility, so much probability, um, and there's so much that is possible now. But people just have to realize that it is possible. I mean, I can, I've been manifesting things instantly. Like it's ridiculous. I, um, like even this trip that I'm taking to the summit, I was getting a little bit worried because I didn't think I had enough money for gas because I was like, that's a really, really far drive. Um, so when I went to go get my rental car, the guy's like, oh yeah, you know, we actually have this Prius if you want it. Here you go. And I was like, oh well, thanks. Well, that helps with the gas money thing. Like, it just little things like that where everything just sets up. By going on the right path, everything works out for me. And I kind of had to go into a place of trust and knowing that, you know, I don't need to know everything. I don't have to know, you know, I can trust the future and what's coming. And that opens up so many possibilities and so many opportunities for me that it's unbelievable. And I think people just are so used to controlling every step of the way, planning things out, like, oh, if, you know, this has to happen and this has to happen. Um, I think you just let go of all that and kind of just be open and kind of go with the flow, then you'll start to see that that life becomes even more, um, even more bountiful. Just it's just so absolutely amazing to kind of just sit back and just watch things unfold for me. And um, and I never ever would have even dreamed that this would be happening, or I'd be talking about this kind of stuff um, a couple of years ago. And because I couldn't, I mean, I literally couldn't talk about military stuff or ET stuff, um, and I had to really fight that. And, and teach myself how to speak out about it, uh, even though there were consequences. Are you surprised at how open you've been received, how openly people have kind of embraced what you've had to bring forth? I am. Um, I was really nervous about the video from Miles in the conference because I had I'd finally started looking in to different um, like alternative news, conspiracy theory stuff, and there's a lot of hatred, a lot of... Um, bickering and infighting and then just people are playing like you know oh you're just crazy you don't know what you're talking about um kind of stuff and i'm like why are people so against this i'm like if you don't want to hear about it or you don't believe it then just leave it alone like why sit there and attack somebody for something um so i was really really nervous i was like great you know people are gonna like start you know saying things about me and uh, my family's gonna find out and so I'm like, okay, well, let's see what happens. And a lot of the times people are like, no, like, no, it's really good. Like, we're glad you're coming out with this information. And I'm kind of like, what? <laughs> really? Whoa. Okay, well, it's good. I'm like, oh, that's... Well, it's 2012, that's, uh, that's and we're really, freaking ready. Oh, I know. I'm just, I'm ready for this to be to be on. Like, I have been waiting, I think, a very long time for this moment in time. So um, I, just, I can't wait to see what happens. I'm really excited. Yeah, yeah, me too. So, what gets better gas mileage, your your bike or the Prius? Oh, uh, it gets about the same, I think. Um, I'm getting a really good gas mileage on the Prius. It's a little bit more comfortable, at least for long distance. I mean, I've gone 13 hours on the motorcycle, but that's exhausting. Um, at least so, if you, if you need to keep the bugs out of your teeth, you take the Prius. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. Um. We've got a few minutes left here. Another of the questions I wanted to ask, I know that you have had lots of experiences in the astral level, not not even dealing with extraterrestrials or government guys. Um, can you talk a little bit about some of the other entities you've run into in the astral as far as, like, elementals? Is any of that? Oh, know, yeah, definitely. Fairy um, sprites, it it, it, it exists. 
it, it exists. Um, that's the first thing I tell people. I've been working a lot with, the, with angels and the angelic realms. Um, Archangel Michael is like kind of just been there with me the entire time, even though they had to tell me like, you know, hey, angels aren't Christian. And I was like, oh, that's <laughs> good point. Because I had a really big beef with like the Catholic Church and stuff, um, even though I was raised as Christian. I was like, you guys are like wrong. <laughs> like this is <laughs> misinterpreted completely. Like I think I was there for this. And I did that since I was a kid. I was like, mom, they're telling it wrong. It's just the way the story went. Um, so I, and the control thing, like I just always saw so much control but they were like yeah no no that's not us we're actually interdimensional beings and i was like oh sweet sorry my bad like cool let's start working together um and they're amazing so i love um i love working with the archangels and um i'm supposed to be making t-shirts for them right now which i'm going to do once i get back from the summit and uh making t-shirts for angels yeah um i bet no one's ever done that before they gave, they, they've, all oh, my guides at least, and this is why I, I don't, like, I'm like, you don't have to be serious about this stuff. Um, they give me a lot of pop culture reference, because I think they find it funny that they can relate interdimensional stuff to, to movies sometimes. But, um, uh, I was in class, cause I was a graphic design school, so I was in class one day, and, um, somebody was talking about the whole, like, Twilight thing with Edward, Team Edward, and, like, Team Jacob, and I was like, oh, my God, why are these people talking about this? And then, clear as day, I heard, like, I saw Archangel Michael, like, walk, like, look at me. He goes, I want a Team Michael shirt. And I was like, what? <laughs> I was like, are you kidding me right now? He's like, no, you need to make it happen. And I was like, okay, I'll make you T-shirts. And then the other oh, Archangel like, awesome. we they're like, we want Team shirts, too, so... Um, you I'm get thinking. those made. You let me know because I think Steve Becko will get one. Oh, with, oh yeah, uh, totally. I, I have them designed. I just I think I'll just put them on Cafe Press and just be like, here you go, people. Here's some. There you shirts. go. Yeah, you let me know where they are, and I'll make sure that, that people find them. <laughs> okay, awesome. so couple yeah, minutes left to... here. Um, real quick, give me the number one thing that you want listeners to take away tonight. Believe in yourself. Um, you cannot find. Truth outside of yourself. Um, that also needs to be discerning because the ego kind of will play games. Um, but if you continue to look outside yourself for information or for guidance, I mean, those are markers. Those are things that allow you to comprehend um, maybe ideas that you haven't been able to think of before, but. Everything you can find is within yourself, inevitably. You will always be able to go within and connect with your higher divine self and get the information that you need. Excellent. Alara, thank you so much for being with us tonight. Thank you. It's, um, it's okay. been a pleasure. And anytime. Um, <laughs> yeah, I'd really like to kind of go over that whole idea with uh, maybe we can do a, a special episode or a short run during an episode uh, where we can do a back and forth um, with... Six with some of your contacts and answer some direct questions from listeners. I think that would be very helpful. Definitely. Um, Definitely. So everybody go check out the super soldier summit this Saturday. If you're in the California area or you really uh, want a, an eye opening experience, cause they've got a slew of people um, who are going to be spilling some truth there. It's in San Rafael, California. You can uh, go to super soldier, super soldier summit.com. Uh, for more information, next week we're going to have another blockbuster show for you. We're going to ha- we're going to have a panel discussion with three people who have experiences inside the secret space program. Our guest will be the granddaughter, great granddaughter of President Eisenhower, Laura Eisenhower, <laughs> Andrew Basiago, and Brett Stillings. You'll hear about secret bases on Mars and the Moon, real time travel experience real teleportation experiences and testimony that none other than a young Barack Obama was part of this and teleported teleported to Mars. So don't miss that. Remember, you can reach us at facebook.com slash extraordinary year. Like us there. Spread the word. Follow me on Twitter at Tim Bravo. And so that's it for us. The 183rd day before December 21st, 2012. Keep your ear to the ground and hold tight, kids. This is going to be an extraordinary year. Hey, I am here to see